This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Come on, Larry. come on. It, we call it the uh, the place. The to be. place to be. Yes, it's the place to be. Then I shall be. Place to be nation. Scott Criscola and Justin Rosero. This is the place to be podcast. It is contagious. It is the place to be, and we are live each and every Monday to, to do to, to do worse than Josh Richard. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. It caught on in a flash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory. Place to be nation. Welcome to the great episode of the one and only Place to be podcast. I am your co host, Justin Rosero. Coming to you live here on this Tuesday evening inside the PTBN studios. And joining me, as always, my PIC, Scott Criscolo. Scott, how are you? Good evening, JR. Good evening, Place to be nation. Welcome to episode. I believe it is 467, am I correct? Sounds right. Of the longest... 466, no, no, no. sounds wrong. For, doesn't matter, because it's still the longest running <laughs> yes. episodic gold standard. Uh, yes, of course, uh, we are on Tuesday this week because uh, my PIC uh, couldn't multitask last night between chewing his nails and trying to pay attention to the show. So, But uh, all is well in the world, because uh, you'll be watching tomorrow night. Series sure to be over, but I'm going to be okay. <laughs> I vented all that out on uh, the last making the cut with Aaron when we recorded as soon as game two ended, and I was uh, very vulnerable at that point, but I'm okay now. I'm okay. <laughs> and speaking of vulnerable, uh, we have a very special guest with us tonight, Scott. We do, indeed. Kelly yes. Nelson is uh, off. Well, I, guess, I mean, I guess he could have maybe ended up doing the show. <laughs> it was He took off last night because of the Canadian Thanksgiving, and then we didn't record because of the baseball game. Um, so, yeah, maybe he could have done this after all, but whatever. We'll give him the week off anyway. He joined us for Sandy Smith event a week ago. But joining us is a gentleman I uh, go way back with, and he's been here before for a couple of specials, but never for a proper episode of the podcast. And he's been listening since day one, and he, of course, is one of the Nano 2 and bros. You heard him yes. narrate a large chunk of the Christmas play from last year, and that is mm-hmm. the one and only Mr. Tim Capel. Tim, how are you today? Justin Scott, it is a privilege to be here and an honor to be asked to be here. I... Uh, Did not have to campaign or grovel, uh, debase myself uh, sexually or or otherwise. (laughs) But, um, you know, I I thought how flattering it would be to to actually be invited on the show proper, the premier place to be podcast. So being on that that Christmas special pretty much took care of your dignity anyway. So (laughs) you don't don't have to worry about it at this point. (laughs) Yeah, I I should I should preface. I'm not above those things by by any means. (laughs) I just, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, so so flattering, and it's, I guessed it's it on your show theme. before you guessed it on mine for for a theme survey says. <laughs> so there you go. That, yes, <laughs> another great reminder. Yeah. yeah. So um, perhaps uh, apologies are are in order to uh, Kelly tonight. I have big shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even think, to, but you were already been booked, so whatever. He'll deal. Uh, so Scott, what's the, what's the deal for tonight? Where are we, sir? This evening, uh, Jr. We're heading actually. Uh, Kel- uh, Tim, you're sitting in Kelly's desk, so don't touch the Lanny McDonald bobblehead. Uh, we are back in our home office after being in uh, my home state uh, last week. So let us go now to January nineteenth, nineteen eighty seven. Our first Madison Square Garden live event house show, Jr. of the new year. Mm. So uh, let's see if uh, we. I knew nineteen eighty six. We had some hits or misses. Let's see uh, what this uh, show brings us. Uh, it is January 19th. It is a Monday. And the roster was split again, this time in three cities. Wow. Of course, we have a cavalcade of superstars this evening. Um, another hunk of the roster was at the Augusta Richmond County Civic Center in Augusta, G- Georgia. Uh, the only three matches uh, that uh, Mr. Cawthon has. Blackjack Mulligan took on Terry Gibbs. The new U.S. Express took on the Foreign Legion. I feel, like I've been, I feel like I've been wrestling for about, like, <laughs> nine months. Yeah. And uh, uh, Ricky Steamboat took on your World Wrestling Federation Intercontinental Champion, the Macho Man Randy Savage. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the other uh, third of the roster was at the – I'm going to have to ask uh, Mr. Greenhouse to look this up. They were at the Pershing Auditorium in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm curious if that's on the campus of uh, – because I don't know what else is in Lincoln, Nebraska besides uh, Big Red. So I wonder if that's the the – you know, the basketball arena or whatever. The Pershing Auditorium, 4,300. It's that boy on it. So there we go. 
Uh, here's your here's your uh, your um, uh, card. The Honky Tonk Man pinned Pedro Morales. Wow, Pedro lays down in Lincoln. He can't do it at the Garden, though. <laughs> uh, the Karate Kid and Little Coco defeated Little Tokyo and Lord Little Brooks, so they kind of went around the circuit with their awesome, hot uh, <laughs> midget tag feud. <laughs> Uh, Jack Kruger defeated Bill Ellis, who subbed for Moondog Spot. I have no idea who either of those what guys the are. <laughs> Pulled those uh, guys Jake out of the Robert. cornfield. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, probably linebackers. Jake Roberts fought King Kong Bundy to a double countout. Interesting, Jake fighting a heel. Uh, B. Brian Blair and Jumba Jim Brunzel, the Killer Bees, defeated Don Morocco and Bob Orton Jr. And Tito Santana defeated somebody in a steel cage match. We won't tell you who that is because he'll be debuting uh, later on down the line. So there you go. So they were in Augusta, Georgia, and they were in Lincoln, Nebraska, on top of... Uh, Pretty spread out. You don't usually see three yeah. rosters spread out that far, you know? Yeah. Usually we'll get, like, two yeah, in the same crazy. city, like, matinee evening show or something, but... Yeah, exactly. Very, very strange. Speaking of matinees, we're going to we're gonna think about that today, because uh, we looked up... This is Martin Luther King Day in 1987, so... The first uh, or second? The pop culture, what did D'Amato say? It was ratified in 86, second. yeah. Yes, it's the second Martin Luther King Day, um, and it's and it, there's a reason why we're we're bringing that up, and I'll get more into that when we get to the pop culture report later. So, uh, Jr., anything uh, anything to add to the fun and frivolity before we kick off? What a fucking tease! On uh, January 10th, <laughs> episode of Superstars, Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth were guests on Piper's Pit. During the segment, Piper gave Savage a ringside ticket to watch Ricky Steamboat's return to the ring. The following week, uh, the 117 Superstars uh, was a very big episode. We had the official kicking off of the Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giants, uh, you know, dalliance in a segment on Piper's Pit. Jack Tunney presented Hulk Hogan with a trophy for being world champion for three years. Ricky Snoombo returned to action, pinning Barry O in under three minutes. Demolition, a brand new tag team, made a debut with Randy Cully, formerly Moondog Rex, playing the role of Smash. Following Hercules' big win over Jim Parks, Bobby Heenan challenged Billy Jack Haynes to break out of the full Nelson. When he came to the ring, Haynes pushed Heenan and was attacked by Hercules, who hooked on the hold. And uh, that's it. That's all we got. So, why don't we head down to the garden, and you already knew that the tone was going to be a rough one, because Mean Gene is back alongside Gorilla oh, Monsoon to open Jesus the year. Jesus Christ. So, right out of the gate, if you weren't feeling... Uh, Rough already, you know, it goes to an MSG show. <laughs> this is number two. And the number three whammy to finish us off is our opener. Oh, at God. least part of it. <laughs> as uh, making a couple of, well, one debut and I guess one kind of return. Uh, Brad Ringens is making his debut. We'll talk about him for a moment. Born in Appleton, Minnesota in December 1953. During his high school years as a multi-sport athlete, winning awards in football, wrestling, track, and field. Was friends in high school with Eric Bischoff. Riggins was, Riggins was a member of the 76 and 80 Greco Roman wrestling team, won gold medals in 1975 and 79 Pan American Games, and began his pro wrestling career in 1980 under Vern Gagne and Billy Robinson in the AWA. Primarily wrestles enhancement talent here before moving on, moving on to New Japan in 1989, retired in 1995 due to knee issues. And he is taking on Sirs. Um, legendary? No, probably not. Um, <laughs> yeah, you would, yeah, like you think he's legendary. The one and only Frenchy Martin. Uh, not his. I don't believe it's his MSG uh, debut. He had uh, well, actually, yeah, no, I think it was. I think it is his MSG debut. So uh, Jean Gagne began his career in 1971 in Quebec, wrestling for Stampede Wrestling. Of course, moved his way through Canada, worked in Puerto Rico as well. Uh, actually, had a 60-minute time of the draw with Ric Flair while in Puerto Rico, so enjoy that one. Uh, won the NWA British Empire Commonwealth title in 1978. Debuted in the WF in October of 1986. Initially full-time wrestler, enhancement talent, and then uh, actually uh, began to host a studio show, Le Studio talk show in uh, Canada on Superstars. Uh, and then he will shift to a different role, which we'll cover. So a couple of debuts here to open things up, and we're off to a very rough start in 87 between Gene and Frenchy. Uh, it just looks as annoying as ever. Uh, Ringen's making his debut as well to defend the U.S. against this worthless French Canadian. I, I thought Frenchy looked about sixty here, by the way. So, I don't, I don't, oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. I don't think he was. Uh, let me look quick at his age. He was born in uh, nineteen fifty, so he, he would have been what thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah, he actually passed 37? away at sixty. He just died last year. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Bladder and bone cancer. That sucks. 
Um, 37? He looked like he was 77. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Gene puts over a theme throughout the show. <laughs> yes, <it> definitely is. <laughs> Gene puts over Brad, who he knows from back in uh, Minnesota, of course, talking about all his credentials. We open with a lockup and a stalemate as the two trade some holds while working the arm. They put over Brad as an All American, and Gorilla discusses how well traveled Frenchy is. Brad grabs a side headlock as Gorilla talks about the importance of having an amateur background, saying you'd be left like a pile of garbage without it. Brad continues to maintain control as Gorilla rips the ref for getting in the mix. Gorilla talks about Frenchy's brother, who's also his former tag team partner. Brad hammers away in the corner and sends Frenchie over the top with a monkey flip before going to the arm. We get some discussion on the importance of leg strength as well as some chatter about goose hunting as the match has come to a halt. Frenchie cheats to take over and empties out all his heel tricks. Brad breaks out another monkey flip to force Frenchie off of him, sending that Canadian bastard to the floor. Frenchie returns and talks some shit as we reset. Brad keeps Frenchie off balance with a flurry and Martin uh, rolls back outside. Frenchie's hurting. He slowly gets back in and lands a sucker punch to take over and goes to a chin lock. Gorilla and Gene talk about Brad's potential and how he could be more successful as he continues to learn the pro game. Frenchie's in full control. Lands a hot shot. Brad bails to regroup, but Frenchie keeps nailing him out to keep him on the floor. Brad forces his way back in and hammers away, getting a small package for two, and then whiffs on an elbow off the middle rope, and Frenchie gets a really lazy cover for two. Brad comes back with a belly-to-belly and hits a shoulder block off the middle rope for the win. Uh, the first two-thirds of this was real dog shit, but I thought the last couple of minutes were solid, especially the finish. Uh, I thought Brad looked fine, but Frenchie's just useless uh, as he slowly meandered through old-school heel offense that just put everyone to sleep. No one cared about seeing. I went half a star just for Brad's uh, energy and for the last minute or two. Uh, what did you think of this one, Scott? Uh, I also gave it a half star. Uh, you ready for the runtime? You ready to squirm? Sixteen forty nine. God, <laughs> that's fucking brutal. Felt like one hundred and sixteen forty nine. <laughs> it really did. A um, few points. Number one, uh, uh, even as bad. What made it worse was, on top of the fact that it was Mean Gene, who's utterly terrible doing this. It even seemed like Gorilla wasn't totally on. Like they, they, like the first couple minutes of this match, they seemed like they were kind of off their game. They were kind of fumbling through their lines, and they didn't seem like ready. It seemed like it was very strange. It didn't seem like they were ready. I wonder if Gene was a last minute thing because it didn't seem like that Gorilla was ready to have him as well. You know, instead of maybe Jesse or Alfred. So it definitely seemed like the first couple minutes they were off. Um, you know, I'm looking it up, and he does it later in the show. I think we got to finally investigate this. Maybe we'll have to have Damato on. What the hell is the deal with? with Gorilla constantly giving Gil Roman shade. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's starting, it's starting to get aggravating now. No, I enjoy it because all these referees suck, so I'm okay. But Well, that's true. And, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I found, like, a, I forgot which must report it was, but they were talking about, like, how each promotion or territory back in the day treated their referees. Like, they were saying, like, in the NWA, you mm. know, uh, what's his name? Not Larry Young, whatever his name is. Um, you know, that referee, the referee everybody likes. And Earl, when he was there, like, they, they were treated with reverence. Tommy Young? Meanwhile, Tommy Young, thank you, Tommy Young. Meanwhile, WWF referees are all fucking garbage. <laughs> That's really crazy. Um, anyway, the posturing and everything was bad. When you mean a uh, lazy pin, is that the one where like pretty much Frenchie shoved his junk in Brad's face during that pin? Yeah, he's got a laser on him. All fucking. He lays his fucking. Crotch Looks like he's in his eating face. a croissant and sipping but, wine like a piece of shit. Yeah. yeah, well, he drops his fucking sweaty French junk in fucking Brad's face. Um, but I mean, Gene. And if you didn't know Gene, if you didn't know Brad Rangins was from Appleton, Minnesota. Well, after this match, since Mean Gene said it like sixty-three times, <laughs> you pretty you pretty much got it down. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, everything about this was bad. Brad Rangins needed a guy that he could grapple with. He couldn't sit there because that's his strength. Brad Rangins is not a, a personality guy. He's not an energy guy. He's a good worker. He's a typical Vern, you know, AWA guy who can put on a good match if you have a guy in there that can kind of go with him. And this. This was not the right guy to have, a typical old school WWF kind of fucking around heel. It didn't work for, for Brad. You really wanted, if you really wanted to get this off to a good start, you needed to have a guy that could kind of go with him. And, and it slowed him down and all the shit in the outside. It, just, it didn't work. It didn't work. It, it almost was a dud if that – because I thought Brad's finisher was really good. And the last minute or so definitely was, was fast. But the previous yeah. – like the, the, the first like 15 minutes was utter trash. Uh, I gave it a half star as well, Tim. Yeah, uh, it sounds like we all watched the same match. I uh, <laughs> put down a half star for it, too. Um, and, I mean, the moves they're using here are fine enough in theory, but the execution just comes across as wonky. I mean, JT you talked about that that lazy pin, but there's, like, these these lame, sloppy arm bars, and Rankins does, like, a half a cartwheel at one point. Um, 
there's a top wrist lock, wrist lock spot, but you know, your favorite Frenchie Martin can't bridge. So that's going to look like shit. It was just loose, really weak looking offense throughout this thing. So aside from that finishing stretch, um, not a lot here. 16 minutes is asking a bit much for a Frenchie Martin, Brad Rangan's match. So (laughs) yes. Yeah. Not a, yeah, not a shrewd idea at all. Uh, and it, you know, I don't know. We, like we seen Nick Kaniski, like he looked pretty good, and now they bring Rangans in, and they kind of give him the same spot, the same style, and you got to sandbag him with Frenchies. It's not going to give him much. Frenchies yeah, trying to, just, I mean, Frenchies working a spot show from fucking Manitoba, 1957 heel offense. You know, what I mean, just like just meandering around, punching the throat, raking the, uh, you know, like yeah, he had a couple flashes here and there, but it's just not. Not not what you want from an opening match. I know people are getting settled in and maybe not watching, but still, you want some excitement in the opener. And this, this, you know, he's the he's the anti energy Frenchie Martin. No, he he absolutely was. Uh, Brad Rangans definitely needed a better guy in this in this slot. Particularly if you were going to go seventeen minutes. I mean, really. And I wondered that too. This is like the the quintessential folks are still filing in match. That's the only explanation I could see for putting putting it on first. I just wish Frenchie had his monocle so Brad could punch it back into his eye. <laughs> All right, we head back to the ring here where Mean Gene hops in to present a very special award to Howard Finkel for his 10 dedicated years of service as MSG ring announcer. The crowd gives uh, Fink a big ovation. He's kind of surprised, and then thanks Gene and the crowd. Seems a little broken up just a bit, caught off guard. And it's funny because I'm so – I don't know how you guys felt, but I'm like so um, conditioned to like just Fink – just being like a dumping ground, <laughs> you know, just like a, I know, uh, you know, just a guy that they beat on for you. I just was waiting for like the shoe to drop where they like hit him with it or lie. And it's not really, at all. like I was waiting for them to fuck with him and they don't, they treat him well, but you know, we're just so used to over the past couple of decades where he just gets treated like a goof. So, um, do you guys have any quick thoughts on this or, well, I'm used to think as the pervert from like, what was it? SummerSlam <laughs> yeah, 2001 or two yeah. with his little exchange with Trish Stratus. So, I'm like, all right, is are we going to get like who would the equivalent? Well, there's no equivalent to that in 1987, but like, is he going to get into this whole fourth entire and just make an ass of himself? That, that's <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, nah, it's a great moment. I mean, I remember the guy with the the guy with the really thick bottle Coke, Coke bottle glasses that did the ring announcing. On the older uh, MSG house shows, you know, JR, if you remember the old, the, the, the network adventure ones, the slogs, and uh, um, Fink just, you know, with his brown tuxedo, just eh, very cool. Very cool. Ten years, very nice. And then he couldn't get the mic to work, which I thought was funny. I thought Fink, I thought uh, Mean Gene was going to, like, sing him Tutti Frutti or something and <laughs> make, it, make it even worse. But, um, no, good moment for Fink. In ten years and 1987. Yep. Wow. Yep, he started in seventy seventy early late seventy six, early seventy seven. Before that it was the like that guy with the Coke bottle glasses that did it like in seventy four or seventy five. Yep. So good for Fink. Ten years, long time. It's a long time. <laughs> All right. Uh next up we get some tag team action as a new team for us to check out, the Can Am Connection taking on our old friends, the Dream Team, Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine. The Can Ams made up of Rick Martell. And Tom Zenk, who's making his MSG debut. Zenk started wrestling in 1984 for the AWA before moving to the Pacific Northwest Territory of the NWA. At the request of Rick Martell, Zenk moved to Montreal to work for the IWA, where they formed the Can-Am Connection. They would then move to Dodef in late 1986. And this is Rick Martell's return to MSG for the first time in five years. Martell, of course, uh, pretty legendary uh, from a family of wrestlers, debuted at age 16, was already a skilled amateur, wrestled all around the world before debuting in the WF in 1980. Formed a tag team with Tony Gurria. They won the tag team titles from the Samoans. Had a second reign where they defeated the Moon Dogs before losing to Mr. Fuji and Mr. Saito. Uh, they would challenge multiple times before Martel left in April of 82. He headed to the AWA, defeated Jumbo Saruta to win the AWA World Heavyweight title. His reign lasted uh, quite a while, well over a year. Uh, had some matches with Ric Flair and others before losing the title to Stan Hansen. And then he shows back up here in 19, uh, late 1986, teaming with Zenk as the Can-Am Connection. 
So that's their background. And now we head to the match. Uh, Dream Team hit the ring with Johnny V. Gorilla reminds us of the Nightmare and Rosemont. As always, Gene says they haven't recovered. <laughs> so, I mean, this has been some some time now. Gorilla has literally t- talked about this every time we've seen the Dream Team since WrestleMania 2 about the yep, Nightmare absolutely. and the Rosemont. Um, I mean, at some point, you're going to think they're over at Gorilla. <laughs> they've won matches. I know. They've, you know, they've challenged other titles. They've, they look okay. Uh, Gorilla says the Dream Team is low-key for the rest of 86, which is funny because we've seen them in, like, big matches all through MSG. It's... I don't know, odd comments. Uh, Gene says Johnny V went to therapy after that loss. Massive pop for MSG. Debut of Can-Ams as Martel and Zenk jogged to the ring, fired up. Gorilla calls them real young, real young, real handsome youngsters. As Gene reminds us that Martel is a former tag team champion. Hammer and Martel open up with Martel quickly grabbing control and working the arm. Zenk tags in and keeps targeting the arms. Gorilla says the Can-Ams are destined for gold. Hammer gets a hip toss but whiffs on an elbow and Zink goes back to the arm. Hammer sneaks free and tags in Beefcake as V pops in on commentary and rips on the Can-Ams, questioning what nationality Zink is. Johnny says the Dream Team is about to climb another mountaintop. Hammer tags back in, but Zink is all over him, hitting an atomic drop for two. Martel tags in and keeps the pressure on the arm and hot shots Martel across the top and tags Beefcake, who slugs away, hoists Martel up over his head, and Hammer cracks him off the middle rope. Beefcake hits a backbreaker for a hammer near fall, and the Dream Team continue to punish Martel. Martel lands a huge right hand to find an opening, but Beefcake tags in and cuts him down and goes to a chin lock. His gorilla says Brutus is one of the most improved wrestlers over the last few years. Gene notes that the Can-Ams recently toured Japan as Martel makes a hot comeback, leading to a backslide for two. Beefcake recovers and lands a boot to uh, regain control as Johnny comes back and says close only counts in hand grenades and cantaloupes, which made me laugh. Uh, for some reason. Hammer tags in and Martel turns the tide with a quick flurry but ends up missing a charge in the corner, cutting himself off. Gorilla says it takes Hammer 15 minutes to get cranked up and that he's a sadistic individual. Hammer gets a suplex for two and tags in Beefcake who goes to a bear hug. Hammer returns and goes to a figure four but Martel blocks it. Hammer goes to the eye and maintains control, getting a roll up for two. Beefcake tags in and Martel punches through him and dives for the tag to Zenk who comes in red hot, mowing through every one of the drop kicks and right hands. Beefcake cuts him down with a hard clothesline and tags Hammer, who gets a three-quarters Nelson and grinds Tom on the mat. Hammer goes to an abdominal stretch and then a gut breaker before tagging Beefcake, who pounds the midsection and then gets an inverted atomic drop. Things break down and we get some chicanery, but the Dream Team can't put Zenk away. So Zenk makes a tag. The referee misses it, but doesn't allow it. Beefcake levels Zenk off the middle rope, but Hammer misses an elbow drop. He keeps control with the figure four as Johnny decks Martel on the outside. Zenk hangs on in the hold until Martel slingshots in with a splash and covers Hammer for the win despite being the illegal man. Gorilla and Gene say Zenk is pretty hurt from the figure four as the crowd has gone bonkers. A really fun match, a hot start for the Can-Ams. They were given a lot of time to tell their story. The crowd was really into the whole thing. The Dream Team was rock solid as always. I like the double heat segment where you thought the finish was coming when Zenk came in, but they quickly turned it around. Uh, strong tag action, nice addition to the division with the Can-Ams. I went three stars, Timothy. How about you? I went three stars. How about that? Nice. Uh, and yeah, this uh, this is a match that you look at and think, well, that should have been your hot opener, right? right? Or main and, event. <laughs> or hell yeah, or even main event. Um, but the always good seeing the Canams, of course. Uh, and I guess uh, you guys, this yeah, this is the first time we're seeing them for a start of the year MSG show. And what we have is a pretty well structured tag match with sort of that, you know, Southern tag type formula with um, really two heat segments on the faces, quick tags by the heels. Hard to go wrong with that, especially when you've got guys uh, as talented as the participants here. Um, I I would be remiss in not pointing out that uh, JT, you coined one of my favorite descriptors in, in talking about Greg the Hammer Valentine. And a few years ago in the earlier iteration of the Place to Be podcast, you know, it always comes up about how uh, Valentine never really ages. You know, he's he's aged really well. He, he's looked the same across decades just about. And you said, well, it's not so much that he's that he's aged well, it's that he was young poorly. And uh, I, I think that was somewhat on display here. <laughs> yes. Um, didn't look up his age, but, but I, I don't think he uh, – he was that advanced, but you know he's just like I said. He's he's always kind of looked like a turtle. That's just the. <laughs> he's the like Arn Anderson, just came out of the womb looking old. He was uh, exactly. born in fifty one, so thirty six, not even thirty five at this point. 
35. Right, yeah. And he, he looks the same today. Uh, so, yeah, I, I really definitely enjoyed this match. I, and they had a, they had a uh, false finish, too, which you don't expect and, and get a lot. You know, back in uh, especially a, just a 80s <laughs> MSG show with uh, Zink in the figure four, uh, you figure that's probably going to end it in some form or fashion. But uh, the faces prevail to a pretty tremendous pop, in fact. So. Uh, I gave it. Uh, I gave it three stars as well. Your total runtime, Jared. Do you think longer or shorter than the first match? Um, I'm gonna say a scooch longer. What do you think, Tim? A little bit longer, but felt shorter. Okay. Well, as I said, the opener was 1649. That debacle. This was 1836. So pretty good, Jr. Slightly, slightly more. Uh, I can just tell by Rick- the length of my notes. <laughs> That's how I can usually judge oh. the match line. There you go. Um, we, they talked about Ricky Martel. I was doing the AWA way. Ricky Martel. Uh, this was his first MSG match since March 14th, 1982. Mm. He and Tony Gurria defeated Cl- Charlie Fulton and the Executioner, who was Baron Mikhelska Kluna, at 728 when Gurria pinned Fulton with a sunset flip. So. This was uh, Ricky Martel's first MSG match since March of 82. Uh, the match itself was fantastic. Great back and forth. Dream Team still, I mean, obviously they're fairly faded as, as a team, but still putting on great matches. Hammer looks good. Uh, and at least for, for once, it's not just lip service that, that the beefer has, has uh, matured and has looked great in the ring. Uh, usually, they just, you know, Gorilla will say that just to, because he feels like saying that, but it actually right. is true. Uh, he said he had a great 1986. Slowly learned, slowly learned, and uh, might be ready for for the next uh, for the next step. Um, the timing on the end fall was rough, though. Like it made Valentine look kind of weak. Like he he felt like that Martel had him hooked for what seemed like 15 mm. seconds, and I think it was I, a while. that's the only yeah it's the only thing that I'm a little that I'm a little I was a little shaky on at the end. But otherwise, I thought it was fantastic. Zank and Martel work really good together. Good workers. And, you know, Valentine and Beefcake, you can never complain about, particularly when they're on their game. Uh, really good match. Good win for the Can-Ams. I, I think this effectively, I mean, in this instance, I think this effectively ends the Dream Team's usefulness as a tag team, which is unfortunate, but at the same time, I mean, they got a lot of mileage, almost, you know, two year, or, you know, a year and a half yeah. of uh They've of been stalwarts so. still on the show, really, since they, yeah. they formed in, like, you know, even those early, remember that couple early times they teamed before becoming the Dream Team? Um, right after WrestleMania one, so it's gonna be kind of weird without them soon because they've definitely been <clears throat> a big part of our show since we've rebooted. Like they've been on almost every card. I feel like in one way or, or another. No, they definitely have. Whether they've been as a team or you know, Hammer wrestles one, B for wrestles the other, and the matches have all been great. Um, that's a shame. But you know, the the, the tag division's got to evolve a little bit in '87, and the Can-Ams are a good are a good uh, team to add, and they kind of beef up the division a little bit because we had said many times, Jr throughout 86 that the tag division was a little thin and needs a little uh needs a little boost mm-hmm. and the can-ams definitely will do that so 1836 your total run time i give it three stars it was an exceptional uh exceptional match and kind of got the crowd back into it after that shit show at the beginning so crowds ready to go until next match. until the next match <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i know oh boy uh we have another debut though uh the outlaw ron bass taking on special delivery jones the outlaw uh, making his MSG debut, uh, Ronald Hurd began wrestling under the name Ron Bass in 1975, wrestled throughout the NWA, where different nicknames followed him, depending on the territory he was in. He was the outlaw, he was the cowboy, and Oliver Bass. I guess maybe that's when he was in England. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> when, when Oliver came into play. Uh, in the early 80s, Bass primarily wrestled in Florida for Jim Crockett in Mid-Atlantic, joined the WF in 1987 for a feud with Black Jack Mulligan. Of course, Mulligan eventually would leave uh, before the feud got off the ground, go back to Florida, and Bass would uh, hang around. We'll see him for quite a while before he retires in 1991. Um, I'd say before this, most well-known for his stint, I think, on Crockett. You know, their weekly TV, he was feuding with Black Bart and stuff, right? So, I, I mean, I think that was. Was he a national champion or in the mix with that belt, too, or something like that? Well, they were a tag team. They were the, uh... oh, shit. The hell were they called? Crap. I don't remember now. But then they split up, and they actually wrestled at Starcade 85. And, right. Um... He was around the, through at least the summer of 86. In NWA? Yeah. 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 
Because he was him and Black Bart wrestled at Starkey eighty five, and he beat Black Bart, and then he had five minutes with JJ. So that was definitely, and he was a baby face. Yeah, he turned face when they split. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember the name of their team. Fuck. Uh, looking it up right here, Shit, the Long Riders. Was... Long Riders, that's it. I think they were like the U.S. Tag Team Champions or something like that. But yeah, uh, Black Bart ended up being the national champion. I think after Ron Bass left or something. But okay. yeah, so. Yeah. All right, uh, so for the match, another MSG, and we're actually working in quite a lot of uh, fresh talent here in late 86, early 87 as we turn things over. Jones has a fresh haircut, looking uh, looking around as Bass jumps him at the bell. I thought was he's just like literally just walking in circles, looking at nothing as Bass jumps him. Uh, Bass keeps pounding and choking away as Gorilla says Blackjack Mulligan won't back down from the ruthless Bass. Bass keeps laying the wood, but Jones comes back with an elbow that sends Outlaw outside. Jones stays on top, working a chin lock as Gene says special delivery. He's headed back to Australia soon. I love that we we've seen none of it, but we know so much about this Australia trip with him and Paul Roma because we talk about it every fucking show now. Uh, Jones gets a crossbody for two and goes back to the headlock. Gorilla says SD has turned around Paul Roma's career, and Gene says we'll see more of them as a team to come. Jones is all over Bass, punching away and grinding headlocks until Bass cuts him off with a knee to the gut and hits a face buster driver for the win. Uh, not much here. Jones took way too much offense, though, I, I thought. Uh, the end, the finisher was the only good spot of the match. I, I, Bass looked fine, and he has like decent presence. There should be a solid mid-carder. But I, I couldn't believe how much offense special delivery took in this one from, from Bass. Uh, I went dud on this, Scott. Uh, did you think SD ate up too much of the match? Uh, I definitely think he did. I actually gave it a half star. <laughs> I actually didn't hate it that much. Um, I mean, well, relatively speaking, I suppose. Um, your runtime much shorter, than obviously, than these other ones, 656. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this was a case where um, Ron Bass probably could have used a, a – you know, kind of another jobber, like a Jerry Allen or somebody like that, you know, some other hump. Um, I think he needed an effective squash here. I mean, SD, you know, did what he could, but it just, it really went at a slow pace. Um, like I said, guys making their MSG debut should should have easy squashes against bums, then move on to the SD Joneses. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe Ron Bass should have had like a, I don't know, uh, Jose Luis wrong. Well, he's already working. I, guess. Um, I don't know, just somebody else. Mm. And, and and I think he'd have been all right. But I think I think SD took too much of this match. Uh, kind of the same thing with Frenchie in the first in the first match with Rangans. Um, yeah. Maybe this, yeah, yeah. Know. You know, uh, yeah, but that's different. Complete... Like that's a heel. It's going a little bit longer. This was built like a squash. You know what I mean? This right. wasn't no, set up true. to be a competitive match. Like that kind of was. Um, I don't know. I just as it. Like, in that one, Ringen still got a bunch of offense in. This one, Bass got nothing and then just wins the match at the end. You know, it was, it was kind of weird right. the way they did it for a heel. No, it, yeah, no, it was very weird. Uh, I thought the end wasn't bad. I kind of liked uh, Bass's finisher. The finishers tonight have been pretty good so far. I liked Ron Bass's finisher. Looked pretty good. So I, I think that's what the half star is for, just for the, just for the finisher. Uh, otherwise, not much here, Tim. What did you think? I, about a year ago to the date, binge-watched, like, all of the Starcades and my first exposure to Ron Bass was Starcade 84. Um, didn't make much of an impression at the time, but certainly he was a presence on those, those early Crockett shows. Uh, so to see him here, um, he's sort of the inverse of Greg Valentine. He looks like he's aged 30 years since 1984. Um, not really sure what happened there, but, uh, as for the match, it's um, yeah, it doesn't have a lot to offer. Uh, I went at least a quarter star uh, for the finisher, kind of a proto pedigree, if you will. Uh, looked like it kind of fucked Jones up a little bit. Like I think he had a, a bloody lip or a bloody nose afterwards. Like maybe uh, he wasn't prepared to to take a front bump on that or something. Didn't know how to take the move. I'm not sure, um, but. He, he was either selling really well or, or legit got his bell rung on that. So, But it was okay. It was short enough to be inoffensive. So uh, I can't knock it uh, too harshly. I'm going to knock you harshly. for uh... Uh, When you were saying binge watch, I thought you were going to say you binge watched every S.D. Jones match. <laughs> oh, Jesus, God. <laughs> we need S.D. Jones supporters. Come on. You got to do it. <laughs> oh. Mm. No. All right. Up next. Uh, oh, geez. This is, this is... 
<laughs> George <laughs> Animal Steel taking on Mr. Oh, Wonderful right. Paul Orndorff. You know, we really could have done this while you were watching the game last night. I don't think it would have been that big of a uh, problem. <laughs> Orndorff's out with Heenan still using Real American as those tensions are lingering with the Hulkster. Uh, but he's clearly been demoted a bit as his big feud winds down after Saturday's main event. Bobby reels a poster of a Miss Elizabeth and carries it around the ring and then hides it as George Steele rumbles to the ring. Heenan holds it in Steele's face and tears it up as Animal looks at him dumbfounded and then chases him around. Orndorff attacks and kicks and slugs away at Steele on the ropes before shoving the torn poster on his face. Animal comes back with some biting and then runs Orndorff into the buckle before tearing it apart. Animal rams Orndorff into the steel buckle and then chases Bobby outside into the locker room. Steel returns. Dumps Orndorff to the floor to a pop and tries to reassemble the poster. Orndorff returns and hammers away, taking back control. Orndorff grabs a camera cable and chokes Steel away with it as Gorilla bitches the ref for not calling a DQ. Gene calls the ref a bozo, but Steel makes a comeback and goes for the hammerlock. He then returns with another Liz poster. Steel chases him to the floor before grabbing a chair and whacking the ref with it <laughs> to draw a DQ. Gorilla says he wishes the ref got caught with a full shot versus the, the light one that he got. Orndorff works over Steel, but Steel fights him off and chases him away. Uh, usual steel nonsense, but I will say this. It had better pacing than normal. I like the Liz poster stuff. I thought that was a nice touch, and it shows off the brain smarts. Uh, Orndorff definitely deserves better, though, and, and some kind of direction uh, at some point. This is okay as a one-month time filler while they sort something out, but th- they need more. Uh, I actually went a star on this, which may be a record for a George Steele match for me. Um, but this may be the best, ma- the best month of Steele's career since he's turned face. <laughs> uh, he had a decent match with Savage, so his main event, and then this one here, which wasn't too, too bad. Um, so a star for me. Uh, Tim, what would you think? Uh, I'll go a half a star. It's it's really more of a segment than a match, really. Um, to be quite honest, at this point, Elizabeth, she just needs to get a fucking restraining order against <laughs> Steel yeah. and Savage. I mean, you got... On the one hand, this this explosive, uh, possessive psychopath that that is her main squeeze, and and fucking steel who looks like he he wants to show her crabs up close. I mean, it's just it's awful that that she has to put up with these these two motherfuckers. So, uh, it, like you said, it's it's time to to move on from this for for God's sake. We had the blow off. What are we still doing here? Um. And yes, Orndorff certainly does deserve better. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, does he eventually? I know he's not on WrestleMania three coming up, but does he finally take some time off for that injury? I know he kind of pushed through it uh, for the Hogan feud for the sake of the money, but um, you know, there, there's a case to be made that uh, it, it's time to to sort of um, put him on the shelf for a little bit and uh, rehab. but I don't think I don't so. Know. He looks like he's pretty active, at least through February, uh, March. And uh, mm. I don't think he really takes any time off at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. Maybe suppose, April, May, it looks like he may take some time. Uh, it's possible, yeah. It looks like he goes I mean, March to June. Yeah, it looks like he takes April and May off. Well, I guess that's something, but already, you know, that arm is showing no real muscle tone, and it's only going to get worse from there, so just uh, feel bad for the guy, because, uh, I mean, that that's a tough situation to be in, and, I mean, now it's easy to look back and say, okay, he was hurt, put your health above your, uh, you know, your ego, but it wasn't just that, it was the money and the very real fact that he could lose his spot. Right. So, and I'm not sure that even today, guys, if they were getting reactions like, like Warndorf and Hogan were back then and making the money that they were making back then, that, that guys today would even go on the shelf. So, right. Not for that kind of injury. Concussion, maybe, no. but not for, you know, neck, uh, where you can still work through it. It's just painful. Yeah. Yeah. So, in any case, yeah, no, not a lot to say for the match itself. Uh, I gave this a dud. Uh, this match was, this was terrible. Um, I felt bad for Orndorff. Uh, they said the official runtime was exactly six minutes. I think that's kind of fudging, but um, the whole Real American thing seems so dated now. He shouldn't even have come out with any music. Um, again, more Gil Roman trashing. The poster stuff was fine, but it really just took away from whatever kind of match they could have had. 
and I'm just I'm just getting so burnt out on George Steele in general. Um, I feel like Orndorff's getting punished here. They couldn't really come up with anything better. It it, it was just really bad. Um, there's a lot of running around, not much in the way of actual moves, and then a and then the stupid chair thing, which you couldn't even swing right, and uh, it was a big mess. I gave it. I a didn't mind the list stuff though. I don't know. I thought <clears throat> you keep the savaging brewing, which I, uh, you know, I don't necessarily want that to continue, but it is. So they do a good job with that, and I, I thought it made Bobby look shrewd, like he's thinking outside the box and fucking with steel. I don't know. I, I didn't mind it. We've seen a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot worse on these. We have seen shows a lot worse. This. No, we have seen a lot worse, but I just I hated it. I think it was, I think I'm more upset because I think Orndorff deserved better, even the, with the feud ending. So. Yeah, I'm willing just, to give them like a crap. month, and we'll see. You know, like I want to see mm. if they find something for him after this. Right. Okay. So six minutes your your time on that match, and uh, yeah, it was it was crap. All right. Now we go backstage. We do. A Gorilla Monsoon's chatting with the King Harley Race about his match tonight. Bobby Heenan comes in in a <laughs> like a rain trench coat. Um, and I know, says, it, was, it was very strange. It was yeah. kind of odd. Well, yeah, I mean, they're obviously admitting this is pre-recorded because they made it like he just arrived at the arena. Bobby mm-hmm. comes in and says, Gorilla talks to only him, not the king. Gorilla talks about signing his main event and how they tried to get JD to bow down. Uh, JD, <laughs> JYD. Duncan should bow down. Uh, JYD to bow down. He then says that JYD made a mistake putting his hands on the robe and crown, and nobody puts their hands on the king. He then says, in all arenas around the world, people are bowing down. And Ray says, if, he, if JYD doesn't bow down, they'll carry his black carcass from the ring. Gorilla asks if the crown is on the line, and Bobby says they won't discuss race ever being beaten. Gene then talks to the Hart Foundation and Jimmy Hart about their tag match tonight. There's no title match uh, tonight as Dynamite is out and being replaced by Billy Jack Haynes. The Hearts have worked hard for this match and now got hosed. Everything seems a little bit fishy, they think. They aren't afraid of Haynes and have no issues with him, but now he's messed with the wrong dudes. And then Gorilla and Gene at ringside talk about Gene's recent work with the New York Giants uh, Super Bowl championship, or um, soon-to-be Super Bowl championship, so NFC championship music video. They compare tonight's main event to the upcoming Super Bowl. So there you go. Uh, and that takes us to our next match as yeah, um, Jerry Allen <laughs> takes on Tiger Chung Lee. Um, <laughs> yep. All the hard hitters coming out here in early 87. <laughs> yes. Big time post-interview uh, break filler match. Gorilla says Tiger Chung is always serious business, says the newcomer Allen's bouncing around the ring, looking fired up. Gorilla knows that Tiger Chung is the master of the martial arts, which isn't true, as we know, Scott. Mm-hmm. Gene points out that he now wears boots. Gorilla thinks he must have injured his ankle at some point. Lee lands a hard blow to the head, but Allen punches back and grabs a side headlock. Lee comes back with a few shots. Allen reverses control and drops a leg for two before going back to a headlock. The two trade some offenses. Gorilla says Tiger Chung's dropped about 20 pounds. He's work, uh, working a bit quicker. Learned a lot from Mr. Fuji before they parted ways. Allen keeps grinding the headlock until Lee powers free and lays in some hard chops and forearms. Allen comes back with a slam, but Tiger Chung kicks him away and lays in some more strikes. Lee drops Allen with a hot shot, but Allen reverses a whip and sends the Tiger hard into the corner. Punches away. Allen hits a sloppy drop kick and a pair of shoulder blocks, but Tiger Chung dodges a third and punches him outside. Allen comes in with a sunset flip for two, but the Tiger's up with some punches. Allen whiffs on a cross body, and Tiger Chung drops an elbow for the win. I thought Allen looked like absolute dog shit. Uh, Tiger Chung completely carried this match. If they were trying to put Allen over in any way, it was a complete failure. He just looked terrible. Um, <clears throat> it was awkward. All over the place. Tiger was trying to thread this together. I thought he looked solid. Just a nothing match, Scott. I went with a big, stupid, hard dud. Um, I gave also gave this a dud. Uh, it's very hard to give a dud to the pride of New Haven, Connecticut. Jerry yeah. Allen. Oh, Sounds God. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's better things in New Haven. Uh, the uh, Tiger Chung Lee with wrestling boots, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, he had, he did wear boots though when he was uh. In world class, as uh, I forgot what his name was in world class, but he was he wore boots there too. Um, yeah, it was, it was not a good combination. It was it was pretty awful. Pretty there's nothing really much to say here. It's fairly terrible. Uh, I didn't get your. I don't think there was even a runtime here, but it was. I couldn't have been more than five minutes. Kim Probably Duke four and a half was his name. And, uh, Kim uh, Duck. Yes, Kim Duck. Thank you, Kim Duck. Not Johnny Chung Lee. Uh, what's that? Not Johnny Chung Lee. Johnny, no, not Johnny Chung Lee. Oh. <laughs> Johnny Chung Lee. Um, no, it was Kim Duck. I just remember now, as you said. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Jerry Allen loses. Poor guy. Don't admit that you're from New Haven if you lose again. Tim, 
really not much to say here. Did you watch, did you binge watch Jerry Allen matches before you watched this? I I didn't have a chance to. I, I apologize. <laughs> I did write down that Tiger Chung Lee versus Jerry Allen was a match that happened on this show, <laughs> uh, and it was a dud. So, uh, hat trick. Awful. He looked awful. He really did. He did not look ready for this at all. And Tiger Chung's pretty good. Like, he's solid. You know, it's not like they. this isn't a case where they stuck him in there with the Frenchie or something that could give him nothing. I mean, the Tiger's pretty good. Maybe Tiger should have been in there with Rangans. Uh, that might not have been too bad, actually. Yeah. I would have, I would have been game for that. He, he would yeah. have probably bumped and moved around for him at least. Exactly, so and and it would made the disaster. offense look good. No, I agree, hundred percent. I think Tiger Chung would have been a good. I think Jerry, I think Jerry Allen getting beat up by Ron Bass would have been perfectly acceptable. <laughs> Fucking disaster. All right, uh, let's head back to the ring, uh, and we'll talk about our big rematch with the World Wrestling Federation Championship on the line as the greatest. Ath- professional athlete in the world today. Hulk Hogan takes on the Ugandan giant Kamala, and this would be Kamala's last MSG appearance for nearly six years, gentlemen. So we'll not be seeing him again on the show, I don't believe, unless he pops on the Man event, but I don't think so. I think we're done with Kamala here. A uh, huge rematch from last month. No DQ this time. The crowd is hyped for this one. The title seems in jeopardy after the last outing in December. The Wizard and Kim Chi lead out Kamala. This is manic presence still exists for the whole entourage. Gorilla thinks Kamala is nearing 500 pounds <clears throat> these days. Hogan comes out with some war paint on his face and gets a huge reaction. Kamala jumps Hogan as he enters the ring, mauling him, whipping him with the title belt over and over. Hogan ducks a shot and punches away and the levels Kamala with the title as the crowds is going nuts. Hogan decks Wizard and chases Kim Chi into the ring, but Kamala pounces and whips Hogan with the belt again before unloading headbutts, kicks, and chops. The crowd tries to rally the champ, but Kamala slams and splashes Hulk for a close near fall, which the crowd bit on. Kamala heads up top but backs off and comes back inside to maintain control. He slams Hulk again, but this time misses a splash to a pop. Hulk mows through the challenger with clotheslines and bites him before choking away with his wrist tape. Hogan drops Kamala with an atomic drop and slugs the challenger to the floor. Hulk comes back and works over all three men as Gene wants to know who's under that kimchi mask. Back in, Hulk slams Kamala but whiffs on an elbow drop. Kamala chops and kicks away some more but seems a bit lost as what to do to put Hulk away. Hulk sneaks to the corner and busts out a packet of powder and throws it in Kamala's face. Hulk then slides out and wipes out Wizard and Kimchi again, comes back in, bashes Kamala with the Wizard's horn, and drops the leg for the win. A uh, hot, red-hot brawl here. Manic pace, tremendous atmosphere. Kamala bringing the goods, felt like a real monster contender, and Hogan comes off like a conquering hero that would do whatever it takes due to the stipulation that's in place. Um, I loved Hogan going after Wizard and Kimchi again over and over, keeping them at bay after last month. I thought that was shrewd. Anytime he had a minute, he ran out there and just wiped them out. In the fun series, uh, there's a really good usage of Kamala. Uh, a little bit sad to see him go, but I thought he was you know really good. He came in, did his work, had two big matches with Hogan and MSG, uh, and I went three stars on this one, Tim. I really enjoyed it. Didn't this few draw, like, disproportionately good national money. Like not yeah. Hogan Orndorff money, but way better than you'd expect for. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you're right. Kamala. I think, yeah, I think they did pretty damn well. I mean, Hogan was pretty hot, probably coming off Orndorff with help, but I think, um, I think Kamala was believable. I mean, that December match, he destroyed him. You know, he's, he was mm-hmm. believable as a potential threat. So. And I, you know, I was sort of questioning and wondering how much of that is, okay, is it like just a Hogan formula match where you could plug any guy into the Kamala role and it's going to do that just because of how Hogan was positioned and perceived at this point? But I don't know. There, Like you said, there's a, there is a lot to it in terms of the intangibles. You, you've got the kimchi and the wizard out there too and their shenanigans. I sort of felt like uh, – Hogan maybe should have been seconded by the uh, the wizard from Conan the Barbarian <laughs> with the the way he was painted up uh, with the war paint. Um, perhaps he was he was resurrected backstage uh, after that loss in December or that beatdown in December. Um, but in any case, this is a perfectly entertaining little match. I think it does exactly what it needs to do. It's the right length. Um, no real dull spots or anything. Um, I went three stars as well. It was a dandy of a match. I actually gave it uh, three and a half. 
uh, your your official time wasn't ridiculously long. Let me see. 7.56. Perfect time for these two. Um, Gorilla gets so confused when there's like these these kind of stipulations. Obviously, like no DQs are, are not common back in the day, but he's like yelling at the ref to take Kamala's weapon away, and then he had no problem when Hogan had the weapon and was beating the crap out of him like two minutes later. Mm-hmm. Gorilla gets so confused when he these these <laughs> no DQ situations. Um, I kind of like watching when Hogan – you know, relatively speaking, since we see it nine years later, I kind of like when Hogan wrestles a little dirty. I think it's something kind of different, something refreshing that he's, you know, he's going to, he has no problem rolling his sleeves up and having a, you know, go a little, little extra to get a win when he's able to, you know, le- legally. I think it makes for a better match. I think it's, 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 it's a different side of Hogan that you don't see a lot. And it was, re- I thought it was really cool. Um, I think this one, may go down as one of Kamala's best matches, I think, of all time. Uh, he's moving well. I mean, he's acting. Uh, he's he's not looking kind of dopey. He's moving around in the ring well. Uh, he's putting some good moves on Hogan. I mean, it was, he, I really applaud Kamala's uh, effort in this match. One of his best matches ever, I think. And I think Hogan was a good foil for him, and vice versa. Um, easily one of the most surprising opponents uh, the first, you know, few years of Hogan's run as world champion. Uh, I don't think anybody expected the matches to be this good. So I, I applaud that from both those guys. As for the end of the match, the Andre stuff was good because it really hadn't been talked. It, it had been kind of only talked about on a pseudo national scale. They didn't really like bring it down to the local house show level. So it was kind of neat to see, you know, Andre and Hogan and and and, and you know him and Gene were and Grill and Gene were kind of playing dumb. So uh, it was fascinating. Mm-hmm. It was fascinating. I really liked it. It was a, something that you normally don't see Vince do, uh, take a national storyline and kind of d- – not dummy it down. That's what I'm thinking of. Kind of put it down on a local level even while it's it's growing. We're not even in the storyline technically yet. Right. And And to put it at a local level is very, very different, something you don't see all the time. So I was very happy with that. I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, it's the gardens. If you're going to do it anywhere, you're going to do it there. So – I enjoyed it. Great, great match. Hogan looked awesome again, but I think I think you you, you have to watch this match if you can find it. Uh, it's easily one of Kamala's best, and I I've, I've been watching Kamala right now in eighty two Mid South, and uh, he's okay there. But I think this is one of his best matches, easily. I think Hogan really got, you know, when you're going to give a Kamala match three and a half stars, and I think they've earned it. You got to give Hogan a lot of credit for it, but Kamala definitely deserves a yeoman's amount of work for, for making this a, a really good match. And the crowd was really into it. After the fucking slough of crap that they've watched so far, I think they really earned a, a good title match. So Hulk Hogan retains his World Wrestling Federation Championship in an exceptional match uh, with Kamala. Yeah, and then after the match, uh, we get some big things pop in. As Andre the Giant comes out to the ring, picks up the title belt, me and Gene and Gorilla Monsoon assume he's there to congratulate the Hulk, sir, present him with the title. Hogan holds out his hands, but Andre just stares at it, and then at Hulk and tosses the belt to Hogan before walking off as the crowd boos him. Gene and Gorilla call Andre aloof and say, this is just his style. Everything will be okay. Uh, every little thing will be okay. Um, <clears throat> I love this. I thought this was fantastic. It really makes you wonder kind of what's going on in Andre's head. Uh, why is he here showing up? Uh, like you said, though, it's MSG. It's really well done. So I, I just thought this was perfect. I, I thought they couldn't have done this any better than how they did it. Is yes. This, sorry. A, I jumped. I, I apologize. No, I, that's I okay. I wanted yeah. to get my thoughts on Tim's out there. So, and give the yes. official yes. description. But yes. yes. Uh, yeah. what, what did you sorry. think, Tim? Go ahead, Tim. I was just wondering, is this the first hint or foreshadowing of what's to come between these two? Um... Yeah, I, I I think so. I think the only other thing that we've really had is the hinting of Andre's suspension being lifted and Bobby being in the room. Like, they've kind of men- mentioned that. <clears throat> so mm. I think that's kind of been talked about. And But that doesn't really tie to Hogan. And the pits that we've seen, I don't think, have had anything to do with Hogan and Andre yet. I think we just had that one where they gave the trophy. Uh, that, well, they said they were going to give the trophy to Hogan. So I, I don't think uh, – no, I think this may be the first salvo. Do you think otherwise, Scott? Uh, I don't know. Do we have the uh? What was the date you had it earlier? What was the date for that Superstars? 
Um, what was the one you, that you said earlier? Because you mentioned something about the trophy. 117 is when Tony gives Hogan the trophy. All right, so two days before this. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's the first. And Andre says, that's where he says, uh, three years as champion, it's a long time. That was that. Well, yeah, so it, well, when does Andre get the bigger trophy? That's the next week? The following week, smaller yeah. trophy. The smaller, that's what I meant, yeah. Smaller trophy. I think it's the following, it's the following week. Yeah, it's the following week. Because February 7th is the is the big one, and we'll get to that on the next, right. on the next show. But, uh, yeah, so that Saturday on Superstars is when he – that previous one is when he did the three is this champion. It's a long time. So the, the scene cool. was there. So Very if, cool. Yeah. So if the Garden viewers watched Superstars two days before, they had an idea what was going on. Slight idea. Slight idea. All right. Why don't we uh, take a break? Uh, JR, uh, uh, I mean, I got to be honest with you. Take away – I mean the tag and 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 Hogan Kamala. Otherwise, this show's like a one. <laughs> I mean, th- thank God that there's something redeeming in this first right. half because it's it's been I mean, it's been pretty terrible. Yeah, and the Andre moment helps as well. Um, Bowie things, but you know, it, it's in ring wise, it's been one of the worst shows we've we've seen in a while. Yeah, we've seen some bad ones, <laughs> bad ones as of late. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, not good. Not good. What do you think, Tim? Glad I could join you tonight, guys. <laughs> Yeah, Kelly's like, I'm having some more Canadian goose. Uh, <laughs> He's goose hunting no, I mean, with Brad Ringens. Yeah, Brad Ringens. Um, I mean, I didn't go in with super high expectations. It is a house show. On the other hand, it's MSG. But, I mean, I think of house shows that I've attended, and they're usually, like, at best, um, two match shows uh, with nothing offensively terrible. And you figure – you maybe got your money's worth um, unless I've been to just some really atrocious house shows, but no, this is not great, but um, it's, it's not, uh, it's not killing me either. Uh, So I've, I've definitely seen actively worse wrestling and, and things that definitely challenged my attention span more than this. (laughs) Exactly. Well, we'll take a break. We got three matches uh, remaining. And uh, we'll see if uh, we can somehow uh, save this. But first, uh, let's take a break. Because. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, pro wrestling announcer Kevin Kelly here. I want to make sure you are all subscribed to all the great feeds here at Place to Be Nation. It's really easy to do. Just head to iTunes or your preferred podcatcher app today and search and subscribe to the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, which, of course, includes the full archives of the Kevin Kelly Show, the Place to Be Nation pod feed, and the Pro Wrestling Only feed. Subscribe, listen, and then rate us and leave feedback today. And be sure to give Justin your true thoughts. I mean, don't hold back. After all, he is kind of a jerk. Just listen to Scott. Place to Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have a ton of great podcasts available to you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceToBenation.com, and we offer those to you on three great feeds. On the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, we bring you the Mothership, the original Place to Be podcast, as well as main event, Lucha Afterground, and our monthly pay-per-view reaction shows, as well as the Our Vantage Point podcast and Jeff Learns Wrestling. In addition to these full-length shows, we also deliver quick-hit pod blasts on topics old and new. Over on the Pro Wrestling Only feed, we dive deep inside the wrestling business with a stacked army of experts leading the way. The feed features potpourri shows such as This Week in Wrestling, Greetings from Allentown, Psychology is Dead, Puro Puri, Stacy and Elliot's Bogus Journey, and the Military Industrial Suplex. We also have shows that focus intently on certain topics like Letters from Center Stage, Space City, and NWA Classics on Demand Adventure, Through the Years, Strong Style History, Strong Style Story, and Mount Olympus. Plus, the feed has the full archives of legendary shows like Titans of Wrestling, Where the Big Boys Play, Letters from Kayfabe, and much more. 
And on our popular Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed, we offer such great shows as the Glenn Butler Podcast Hour Spectacular, Rank and File, PTBN Dadcast, Go Home in a Box, NBA Team, and Lucha Undead, as well as a vertical podcast heaven for comics fans with the hard-traveling fanboys, Sellers Points, Todd Weber's Conversation, Geek and Sassy, and Imaginary Stories Podcasts. You can find all these current shows plus archives of our past podcasts, including The Kevin Kelly Show, as well by subscribing to all of our feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on PlaceMination.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects, and more. Be sure to support our site by using PlaceMation.com backslash Amazon when shopping online, and download our free PTB Vintage Vault Refresh eBooks via the links on our site. We also want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar in West Warwick, Rhode Island, and Fall River, Massachusetts, TheHistoryWrestling.com, and Scott Keats' Blog of Doom. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaceMation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. This is Gary Michael Capetta, and this is the Place to Be Podcast with Scott Riscola and Justin Rosero. All right, Nation, we're back looking at a very dismal January 1987 Madison Square Garden house show. And uh, just talking about this, listen to this, is just give me the shivers, give me the shakes, shaking me right down to my core. And uh, also being shook down is, of course, the one and only Greg Abbott. You hear him uh, crooning beneath us as we welcome you back in to the show. And, of course, that means it is time for the Criscolo Pop Culture Corner. Have at it. Thank you, JR. And, uh, yes, uh, so if you didn't know this song, or you knew this song because it was on the radio a lot back then, and you didn't know who sang it, you thought it was, you know, like Atlantic Star, one of those R&B artists, you know, nope, it's this mysterious guy named Greg Abbott, and he was the number one song in the country. The list came out uh, two days before, January 17th, that Saturday, and it is the number one song in the country. Number two, uh, up three spots was our pal Robbie Neville, who will say la vie, say la vie. Number three, uh, moving down a spot, Notorious. By Duran Duran. And Puff Daddy. And Puff, yes, exactly. Um, number four, the oh, the original, the the previous week's number one, which was our number one a couple weeks ago when we had the Science Man event, Walk Like an Egyptian by the Bangles. Number five, for those that were watching Family Ties, everyone knows what I'm about to say, a little At This Moment by Billy Vera and the Beaters. Number six, Control by Janet Jackson. Number seven, our girl Madonna, Open Your Heart. Number eight, one of the strangest videos in MTV history, Genesis, Land of Confusion. That's the one with all the... The weird uh, puppets and uh, number nine is this love by Survivor, and then our song that we played last week. Everybody have fun tonight, Wang Chung, down to number ten. So there's your top ten. Greg Abbott, "Shake You Down" is your number one song in the country today in 1987, January 19th. Uh, okay, three movies, Jr. Much less than what we had last week, <laughs> much smaller, and all of them actually made some decent money too. So. Uh, the number three movie of the week. These all came out on Friday, January 16th. A action film. It made $6 million. It is called Wanted Dead or Alive. Hmm. A song we may actually get to know later on in 1987. But. Yeah. Um, hang on. There's a lot of things. Put, call that. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. We've got Rutger Hauer and Gene Simmons in this. Uh, looks like it. God, he's <laughs> jumping over my shit. I'm get Kelly and his goose back on here. Uh, Nick Randall <laughs> is a Los Angeles-based bounty hunter and ex-CIA operative asked by a former co-worker to help tra- track down terrorist Malak Al-Rahim. However, Al-Rahim is looking for Randall, and Randall's employers are telling him where to find them. The result, this results in the death of his best friend, Sergeant Danny Quince, and his girlfriend, Terry, eventually forcing a showdown on the waterfront. Starring, as you may have heard, Rutger Howard, Gene Simmons, Robert Gim. Mel Harris, William Russ, uh, no one else really of note. Any thoughts on this one, Tim? <laughs> I thought it was a Western. <laughs> that does Eastwood. not sound like a Western no, from the description. Not. No, it's not. 
it's not. Okay. All right. Well, your number two movie of the it weekend. It actually was oh. to a uh, Nick Randall is a descendant of character Josh Randall, who uh, Steve McQueen played in a TV series, Wanted Dead or Alive, in 1958. So it seems like it's okay. kind of a trickle down. And Mel Harris, that. by the way, is a woman, in case anybody was interested. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Number two. Play Terry, who a, got killed. Yes. A thriller suspense film made $12 million. Six hundred. Hang on, hang 000. on. She also had one, two, three, six husbands. Jesus Mel Christ. Harris. Mm. She's currently married wow. to Bob Brush. Okay. She was married to David Silbergeld, Brian Kilcommons, David Hume Kennerly, Cotter Smith, Michael Toomey, and now Bob Brush. <laughs> Is that the first husband you're going to say she's married to David Silver? <laughs> I wish. Oh, he, yeah, he wished. Right. Don't we all wish? She would um, be shocked. He, well, they broke yeah. up because he banged Nikki in the beach house, so that's why they... That's exactly right. That's yep, right. Divorced. Yep. yep. It wasn't uh, his first time, either. <laughs> well, that... Actually, that was, wasn't it? Yes, it was, I believe. Yes, it oh, was. Oh, my gosh. Yep. All right, your number two movie uh, made $12,640,385, a thriller suspense film titled The Bedroom Window yeah, of the Beach David House. Yes, yeah. yeah, so of the Beach House. Uh, it looks like it's a remake. Psychological thriller film. Terry is having an affair with his boss's wife, Sylvia. One night after an office party, they're together, and Sylvia witnesses an attack on Denise from Terry's bedroom window. She does not want to expose the relationship, so is reluctant to talk to police. Terry, wanting to help, gives the police a description of the attacker, but is not able to identify him during a lineup. Nonetheless, he soon discovers who the attacker is after another murder by the serial killer. He becomes the main prosecution witness. Starring... The one only illustrious Steve Gutenberg, Elizabeth McGovern, uh-huh. Isabel Hoopert, Frederick Coffin, while Sean, of course, Gutenberg was on this ep- uh, season of Ballers. So if you're looking for some updated Gutenberg <laughs> to get into, Very it's, interesting. Uh, it's on there. Interesting. And the number one movie of the weekend, a comedy made over $20.2 million. It is called Critical Condition. It's the one that had the fat boys in it. Made very well. Uh, not, but... No, that was Orderlies, wasn't it? Or di- oh, disorderly, disorderly, yes. disorderly, disorderly, yeah. This has a uh, someone a little bit more famous than the Fat Boys. Uh, Kevin Lenahan is an African American <laughs> con man framed in a jewel robbery in order to escape custody be- uh, before faking he- before he fakes insanity and then poses as surgeon Doctor Eddie Slattery at a local hospital where he switches places with the administrator Arthur Chambers during a flood of power outage before Kevin takes charge of the hospital and tries to maintain some order in his unorthodox way. And starring, of course, as Kevin Lenahan, is Richard Pryor, Rachel Ticotin, uh, Ruben Blades, Sylvia Miles, Randall Tex Cobb, Bob Saget is Dr. Joffe. There we go. Yeah, Re- Wesley Snipes is an ambulance driver. So I think it's early, Tikotin. Uh, no, Tikotin. Tikotin, Tikotin. I think it's Tikotin. Yeah, Tikotin, whatever. The shit. Anyway, Richard Pryor's in it, so that's why it made so much money. And that's it, JR. Those are the only three movies that came out that week. Uh, this is the bye week, as uh, as Mean Gene mentioned, uh, for the Super Bowl. And Super Bowl 21 will be this coming Sunday from the Rose Bowl in Pasadena between your NFC champion, New York football giants, and the AFC champion, uh, Denver Broncos. Let us go to the uh, to the hardwood today in the National Basketball Association. Tim, what's your uh, NBA team? Do you have one? Oh no! Actual sports, I, I I've got nothing to add to this oh, okay. segment. Absolutely not. Okay. Basketball. That's like that uh, that that work shoot sports entertainment thing. Is, is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes, it's Rodzilla. Yes, exactly. Mm. Um. Anyway, there were eight <laughs> there were eight games on this evening. This assumes uh, a Blues fan like everyone else. You just guess. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, eight games in the NBA on this evening. Your high score, actually Magic. Magic Johnson had 42 as the Lakers beat the Nets, 126-115. Now, the reason we were talking earlier about Martin Luther King Day is because the Knicks actually played at the Garden today. Uh, they beat the Celtics 111-109, even though Larry Bird had 35 points. Uh, the Knicks won by two, um, which, is, which kind of had us talking yesterday about was the Nick game during the day and this was the night house show or was the house show a matinee and this was at night and uh, our good friend Mr. J. Arsenio D'Amato said that they really didn't get into the whole you know Martin Luther King matinees for a, you know probably another decade I suppose so we're not quite sure but I mean I'm going with the common sense the 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 Nick game was probably during the day mm-hmm. I'm guessing so we'll assume that the Knicks were playing during the day and then they switched it up and went from the part the the, the court to the uh, to the ring. But the Celtics, uh, the the Knicks did beat the Celtics 111, 109, even though Larry had thirty five. 
Uh, so those are the eight games. Uh, there were eight games in the NBA on that evening. In the NHL, uh, Tim, that's the sport where they play on ice. Just want to check. Oh, oh, yeah. That that's why the floor is sometimes ice in the in the arenas. They Exa- talk exactly. Uh, exactly. I see. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It all again, comes don't, together. Don't don't touch Kelly's Lanny uh, Lanny McDonald uh, bobblehead. Uh, our our Whalers uh, play Jr. They beat the uh, Canadians five four in overtime. And uh, Mr. Diamat, speaking of the Mr. Damato, his Rangers they were on the road out in L.A. against the Kings and they played to a two two tie. And I, I realized I did this last year and I had not done it at the start of this season, so I'll do it now. Uh, I was doing the weekly uh, college basketball top ten. Uh, your top ten as of uh, this. This week, your number one team in the country, Iowa. I don't remember who was on the Hawkeyes. Uh, two through ten, North Carolina, Indiana, UNLV, Purdue, DePaul, Syracuse, Temple, Illinois, and Clemson. That's your top ten. And that is it for your pop culture report. Pretty pretty cut and dry, straightforward. So right. let's sadly uh, not stall anymore and see if we can salvage this show. Let's do it. Uh, Jimmy Hart hits the ring before our next match. Says that the Hart Foundation win the t- win tonight and are able to pin Davy Boy Smith. They will own half of the tag team titles. So we'll see. And as things uh, degenerate from there, from bad to much, much worse. Welcome in Lanny Poffo taking on the Red Demon. Big time cool. Th- was Red Demon right? Yes, I believe Red Demon. Uh, big time cool down match here. Yes, Poffo and his huh. It was. No, I'm just okay. confirming. You know. uh, Poff on his perm and turtleneck jacket are back in the house against a mysterious demon. Looks like he walked right out of job lot with that outfit on. Poffo reads his usual poem talking about New York winning the World Series and soon the Super Bowl. Poffo works through some basic offenses, demons moving in slow motion, bumping around. Gene wonders who's under the hood and says it could be a member of the Broncos. Demon ends up on the floor and slowly climbs back in as his job uh, as he meanders on aimlessly. Gene and Gorilla rambling about Demon's tights, wondering what the material is that they're made of. Poffo gets an atomic drop and tries to rip off the mask. Demon takes an object out of his tights and jabs Lanny's throat. Lanny comes back with right hands and chokes and again goes to the mask. Gorilla talks about how he tried to rip off a mask one time and he finally did and the guy had a second one underneath. This is how uh, pedantic this has been. Gene is talking about the dignitaries in the crowd as Demon works some basic offense. Poffo comes back with an Irish whip and gets a roll up. But Demon is in the ropes. Demon turns the tide by choking Poffo with his wrist tape as the match is set as it, setting his back now about two decades. Demon does some weird strutting around in between even more awkward offense. Gorilla and Gene talk about Ricky Steamboat's recent run as this, this drags on and on. Or recent return, I should say. The referee discovers Demon's choking tape, so Demon digs in his tights and loads his mask and decks Lanny with a headbutt. The crowd is really just turned on this now, finally, as Gorilla questions why the ref didn't check Demon before the bout. Lanny mounts a comeback and again tries to yank off the mask before drop-kicking Demon to the floor. Gorilla cl- credits Lanny's cardio as D- Demon meanders around. Demon goes back to his tights, but Poffo catches him and slings him to the corner. Poffo goes to the mask, but Demon headbutts him with the loaded mask again and gets two. Demon whiffs on a back elbow off the middle rope, and Lanny follows with a slam and somersault splash off the top for the win. Thank God. Uh, this was fucking brutal. Demon was awful. And I'm guess uh, I'm, I'm assuming or being told anyway who it was was Jose Luis Rivera. So not one for his highlight reel. Uh, way too long and awkward. Slow waste of time. Maybe if Kelly was here, he would have found a way to give the masked guy some love. But I went with a pure, unadulterated dud. And I thought Demon was one of the worst performances we've seen. And that is on a card with Frenchie Martin and Jerry Allen. Somehow Demon found a way to fucking top both those guys. I thought he was awful here. And the match sucks, Scott. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty fucking horrendous. I believe I gave it a dud as well, and uh, I gave it a half star. How about that? Oh my god! <laughs> I think maybe for Poffo's hair. I don't know. Um, but it was it was pretty fucking fourteen thirty eight. This match was. Oh. Um, Gorilla says this is the most lethargic he's ever seen the demon feel bad for the poor bastards that were the demon before he had to be this guy uh crowd should not have been treated to this after the hogan stuff but i know you need cool down matches but this is just and of course the referee's getting bashed as usual um i don't know lanny i thought did the best he could he had a couple of decent flips so i'll give him the half star for that but otherwise this this is just this is awful um this is the problem and, and and we've talked about this a couple times in the past with kelly about the whole splitting of the rosters like why they had to go all the way to fucking lincoln nebraska Instead of having some guys wrestle here, I just don't get it. 
if you got a big card at MSG, why are you like sending everybody else everywhere else? I mean, it, it was it, it boggles the mind because it just made this this card so much worse, and 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 left with nothing on, in in V Mecca while you know. Uh, Savage and Steamboat are wrestling in some toilet in Augusta, Georgia. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. It just makes no sense. Uh, and, I, and I think this card suffers because of it. I think there's no need to have to send all these guys to other parts of the country today. So, uh, and that's why we get a piece of shit like this. That's why we have, you know, the poor Red Demon. I know that if they might as well just had, like, Rivera as a heel. Nah, that would have been terrible. Uh, half star for me, Tim. Pretty much for charity for Lanny, you know, maybe for a couple of flips. Yeah, I mean, no love for, for Lanny's swanton bomb that he, he won the match with. That's fine. Um, We've seen it 55 times already, so it's not <laughs> as impressive after yeah, that's that. True, yeah. How long was that shit fest? 1438. Oh, God. 14th. That and the Frenchies, a half hour of absolute dog shit garbage on this card. <laughs> All right, well, I have, a, I have a theory about the Red Demon. Would you mm, care to hear it? I guess. So the Red Demon... Um, and I'm sorry, spoiler for, for an upcoming show, you guys will get to it uh, in about 10 years or, or more. The main event of, of SummerSlam 1994, Undertaker versus Underfaker, right? And big question surrounding where where did Underfaker come from? Well, my theory is that he is from an alter, alternate dimension, was summoned by Ted DiBiase, and this dimension, it's it's proportionately smaller than our own, so that's why he he didn't match up, you know, size wise with with our Undertaker. Well, the Red Demon is from that dimension as well, and you know who he is. He is none other than the Demon Kane, or as he appeared in 1987. So that that's your retcon. That that's my head cannon for this match. That's how I brought it up to a full quarter star um, in, in my assessment here. I mean, you got to figure he's, he's a few degrees removed from, from arcane, understandably, but, but I think it works. I, I think it does. And um, as for Lanny Poffo, he, he sort of looks like the missing member of uh, the new day and his, his outfit here um, quite striking. So uh, yeah, this, this was way too long. Um, not exactly Flair Steamboat. Um, n- not even Alicia Fox versus Molina, I'm afraid. Huh. So let's move on. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I would agree. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. You have to admit it was more entertaining than the match. Oh, God, yes. The match was awesome. Yeah, that's true, too. I mean, it could have been Kane. I mean, the work rate. Uh, no, I mean, Kane's better than this guy. Right? So do you think it was like developing Kane, like he hadn't really learned anything yet? I'm not sure how these time zones work. Yeah, 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 definitely. He's still, um, you know, burn scars, Kane, okay. basically. Yeah. Then he should have maybe burned in the fire. <laughs> this is what we had to deal with. <laughs> well, you know. All right. Uh, next up, uh, let's see if we can save things a bit. As a uh, feud continues from Sammy's Smith event, it actually started back in December on the uh, circuit, rolled through that Sammy Smith event, continues here as the Junkyard Dog takes on the King Harley Race. Race and Bobby head out that regal music accompanying them. Gorilla says he's never seen a king with an elastic band holding his crown on like Race has. That Gorilla is like the best part of this whole show, by the way. <laughs> he's been a, a highlight. I know he is. Uh, carrying a lot of dead time. Uh, Heenan demands everyone bow for the king and is met with great heat. Danny's in the ring, but officials come down and reveal that he was not assigned this match. He's forced to go to the back to a big pop. JYD and Grab Them Cakes get a massive pop, too, and the crowd's all fired up. Finally, something to cheer about. JYD opens up hot, slugging Race to the floor and battering him back inside before pelting him with headbutts. JYD grabs a chin lock, and Bobby stops in on commentary. says everyone will bow to the king. Race breaks free and gets a gut wrench for two, but JYD shrugs off the right hands and unloads his own, sending Race crumpling to the mat and eventually to the floor. 
race comes back in, takes over with punches and knees, picking up a near fall as the crowd rallies the dog. JYD fires back again and sends Race right back outside. JYD follows and they head trade headbutts and right hands on the floor until JYD rams Race to the post. The dog slips in the ring and wins by count out, leading off to a pissed off Bobby screaming at the referee. Race attacks JYD from behind, beating him with his own chain and wrapping it around his throat so in face so Bobby could yank on it. Um, I, this is fun and I mean, it's probably exacerbated by the shit we've seen so far that maybe made it seem a little bit better. Um, but I, I thought it was uh, a good brawl. Never really settled into much of a format. Just a lot of back and forth. But it was hot brawling, and the crowd loved it and gave a lot of heat to the feud. I liked the beat down at the end with the chain. I went two stars on this. Um, again, it could be a product of the card that we've been watching. But uh, I, I thought this was pretty solid. Um, what would you think, Tim? It was okay. I mean, compared to the last match, it's a miracle, but... Um, to be honest, I, I had to take a break after the last match and <laughs> sort of came in on this fresh. Flush so the computer down the toilet. Didn't have a lot to offer, I'm afraid. Um, you know, Bobby elevates a lot of the material here, as he does with most of what he's involved in. I mean, getting involved on commentary and just his, his antics around the ring, uh, you know, as usual, you, you sort of find yourself paying more attention to him than, than the match especially one of this caliber. Uh, what must a man like Harley Race think of this this plum robe and, and crown <laughs> getup? I mean, it's it's Harley Race. He's got the you know the, the ancient prison or, or navy tattoos. It's I I just there's a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance there for me. Um he seemed Again, okay the, with it, though. Like, I don't know, he seems to be buying into it, I guess. I, no? I guess. <laughs> a lot of people think of his uh, swan song as, as being, you know, the cage match against Flair loses the title in, in 83. But right. you forget that he really hung around for, for a while after that and had this run in the WWF. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's I don't want to call it a total blind spot for me uh, since I have seen more of it in recent years. But... Uh, I sometimes think he doesn't get the credit that, that he deserves as being still a pretty solid hand at this point, or at least, um, you know, a, a dependable worker in situations like this. But um, as for the match, I don't know. Let's call it a star. Um, doesn't do a great deal for me. Scott? Uh, your official time, 527, and you can definitely tell that this wasn't, you know, like this was growing. I mean, well, we've seen on Saturday's main event, it's been talked about on the, on the Cindy's, and now it's at MSG. You know that 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 there's a blow-off somewhere, and we all know where, but you know, we'll, we'll allude to that as we go down the line. But uh, it's amazing how bad things have gotten in five years. I was watching a Mid-South episode of Mid-South today from, I think it was June of 82, and JYD is trim, and he's moving around the ring, and... And, you know, he's, you know, crowd's crazy. Fast forward ahead here, you know, almost five years and four and a half years. And he's a he's a mess. <laughs> he's an absolute mess. Um, as for the thing you said, Tim, about, you know, would Harley Race be caught dead with the robe and everything? You know what? It's Harley Race. Guy knows guy knows the business. I'm sure he's I don't know if he was crazy about having to dye his hair blonde, but um, I thought he I thought it was kind of interesting, but I do like that Gorilla makes fun of the stupid rubber band strap because it's just so it's so obvious. It looks so stupid. He looks like a like a logo for like, you know, devil dogs or something or some kind of like, you know, tasty cakes. I said he's he's always looked like the kid from Bad Santa grown up. (laughs) I've used that joke a lot, so I I am sort of obligated to put it out there, I think. Funny. Um, But yeah, it's it's I mean, it's fine. For what it is, it's JYD. Um, he's as good as he's going to be. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much better these two could get. Jr. I mean, it's not it's not great here, <laughs> so I don't know how much more of an upgrade you're going to get. Yeah, no, it, you know? I mean, it is what it is. It's I've 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 liked the feud so far because they both kind of brawl well, and race is such a pinball bumper. That it kind yes. of fits well with JYD's limited offense is just pretty much punching and headbutts at this point. So I, I think he makes the match as watchable. 
I've just really enjoyed Harley since we started watching him. Like, I, I thought everything we've seen him in, he's been pretty entertaining. I, I thought it was a pretty good premise, too, with Race wanting everyone to bow down and Dog being too proud. You know, it's like, yep. I don't know, it kind of fits. Yeah, I mean, do I wish Dog could go at a better clip at this point? Sure. But I, I think for what it is, it's it's not a bad. It's a good high-profile feud for Harley. Uh, outside of maybe, like, Tito Santana, like, who else could Harley really be feuding with right now higher right. up the card than JYD? I mean, there's really no one else that fits. Um and I'd rather JOD be working with a guy like Harley that can bump around and work with him versus someone that's whatever, just kind of there and can't make JOD look good. Like, right. it's almost like the funk template, right? I mean, Terry was so good at bumping around and creating a wild atmosphere that it made those JYD matches watchable because it's funk wrestling himself. And it feels like maybe a slightly poorer man's version of that with Harley, where he's so good at bumping around and, and brawling that he's hiding a lot of JYD's deficiencies. So that's I think true, it's a good yeah. feud that I've actually enjoyed. And I've, I've, like seeing the depth behind it versus just a match at WrestleMania. True. And and I, I like that you said that it's kind of hiding the fact that JYD is just a big fat toad who can't really do anything anymore. Right. And that's how good Harley is too. And, and anything with Bobby is top, top notch anyway. So, uh, and I believe, uh, the Fink, uh, I know they go to commercial. It's kind of weird how it was cut the uh, version right. we watched, but yeah, he Fink. runs through the matches for next month, but we'll uh, yeah. we'll save those well, for our next show. Exactly. Yep. yep. And that takes us to our main event as the Hart Foundation, the number one contenders, taking on Davy Boy Smith and Billy Jack Haynes because Dynamite Kid had suffered a serious injury in a tag match December 1986 in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. While recovering in the hospital from back surgery, Dynamite would later recount that Bret Hart showed up and said Vince McMahon had sent him to get the tag titles. Uh, Dynamite refused, and shortly after checking himself out of the hospital against doctor's orders, he met with McMahon, who requested the Bulldogs drop the tag titles to the team of the Ford Legion. uh, Dynamite refused, saying he would only drop the belts to just one team, and we'll see who that is uh, very soon. But here, uh, the Hearts are a little pissed off, gentlemen, because they should have been challenging for the tag team titles tonight, but Dynamite is indeed on the shelf. Time for our final match. Danny Davis is the official this time around, not sent back. Gorilla talks about him being under great scrutiny and think it clearly announces him as a ref. So something's big here with Danny Davis. Like, we don't usually get ref announcements from the Fink, and he clearly says who it is. And it actually caught me off guard because at this point, I thought they were pretty good at the details. So I'm, I was surprised they didn't have Fink, like, announce the referees all night. You know what I mean? Like, to make it not stand out like the way it did. Yeah. But um, no, I agree with that. Yeah. It really stands out. So they're pretty much saying, like, he's a... He's a fuck. Uh, Jimmy leads out the hearts to some really good heat, and they are followed by the makeshift team of Davy Boy and Billy Jack, replacing Dynamite, joined by Matilda, and played out by Rue Britannia, as, all, as always. Very warm welcome for them. Matilda goes after Jimmy, but the mouth escapes her, and we get some stalling and feeling out before we open with Brett and Davy. Davy overpowers and frustrates Hart early, battering around and crotching him on the top rope. Davy, uh, Davis gives Davy some shit as Brett escapes and tags Anvil. Davey tags in Billy Jack, and he and Anvil trade some power offense while Billy's working the arm wherever he can. Davey gets tagged back in, gets trapped in the corner as the hearts start to go to work, quick tagging, double teaming, busting out some fun heel tactics, pitching them outside when they could. Gorilla and Gene rip Davis from missing everything as the hearts continue to batter and double team Davey. Davey sneaks in a crucifix pin, but Davis was tied up with Billy Jack and then slowly counts two as the crowd flips out. Davey breaks up a chin lock and then press slams Brett and crotches him on the top rope again. Billy Jack gets a tag and cleans house, but Davey gets in the way. Billy slugs him to the mat. Haynes grabs the full Nelson, and Davey fends off Anvil as a new ref comes down and calls for the bell as Brett submits to a huge pop. Uh, I like this a lot. Uh, again, it was all about pushing the Davis angle. It was really well done. Very good at being in the wrong place at, at all times to allow the cheating, but it made it look smooth. Like, it didn't look... It didn't look obvious or forced when Davis would get caught off guard to allow the heels to cheat or to fuck the faces. Like, I thought he was really good at just being in the right place at the right time or right place at the wrong time, however you want to look at it. Uh, the heat on everything Davis did was great, too. It pushed the heart to, Hearts and Bulldogs feud as the Hearts have been elevated finally to the top team was the Bulldogs start to fade. Uh, match itself is just fine, again, but I thought everything around it was what carried it, the story, the heat, everything else. Um, I thought it was really well done. So, I, I, you know, we missed Dynamite from a work rate perspective, but I don't think we missed him from a story perspective. I think this pushed things along nicely. I went two and a half on this, Scott. Uh, I give this two stars. Uh, your official time to end the show was uh, 9.26. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is different than than Gorilla Trash and Gil Roman. Uh, <laughs> that's just that that's on that's under the table stuff. Obviously, you know, with Danny Davis, uh, I like the climax when when Danny Davis actually is holding like it's it's evident now there he's like holding Billy Jack back to to let him get hit and good job by Billy Jack to dump out of the way and get to the end ma- get to the ending of the match. Um, Obviously, this leads to Dynamite, you know, kind of going downhill from a uh, work perspective. This back injury never completely heals, so that's kind of unfortunate. Uh, the ending was great. Uh, once again, fucking Anvil gets protected. I just, I just don't understand that, but I guess it doesn't really count at that point. Um, good way to end the show. Crowd got into it, and the Danny Davis stuff was good, but I agree with you about the lack of continuity they should have had like the announcing of the referees the whole match but you know so so it is um solid i enjoyed it uh two stars and you could definitely like i said jr after we said the heart foundation was kind of floating aimlessly through time uh they finally are in the spot that they uh that they need to be in what do you think tim i just found myself thinking why couldn't dynamite have just gotten hurt a month later I, I don't want to upset the karmic balance by by suggesting that he never should have gotten hurt. These things happen, but uh, push it off a month. Come on, give us a proper bulldogs heart hearts match to to really save this this show. Um, but as it stands, you know it's it's non title. It's it's got a substitution, and that sub is Billy Jack Haynes. So I mean that does drag it down. Um, quite significantly, uh, not terrible in terms of just how it's worked as a match. Uh, I will say I was, um, because I've been watching as much WCW as I have lately, I was totally expecting a, uh, a dusty finish, but no, sure enough, the, uh, the faces do go over no reversal there. Um, so you, I guess send the crowd whom happy, um, thought Brett showed a lot of fire in the pre-match uh, promo. Uh, we think of Brett as not being the greatest talker, of course, um, especially early in his career, his WWF career. Uh, later on, you know, you'll see him with the glasses uh, because he was nervous, delivering promos, that kind of thing. But here, I uh, kind of thought he showed some swagger. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm... Uh, maybe I'm Vibing on some heel Bret Hart mm-hmm. uh, more than mm. I thought I I did really. So uh, yeah, I mean, decent enough match. You just look at it as what could have been. I I guess. No, Bret's and I definitely gave it, uh, yeah. two stars. No, I agree. Brett's definitely developing more and more. You can see it in his uh, attitude, the way he carries himself in the ring. He's always mm-hmm. been a great worker since he arrived, but he's starting definitely to showcase his personality a little bit more in the swagger. And I think part of that probably comes with the confidence of finally being pushed up the card. You know, we've been talking about this, Scott, how where have they been <laughs> for the last like two years? You know, it's like they're kind of around, but not really doing anything. It's like here we are finally getting elevated now after all this time. And not only... Do you wish maybe Dynamite could have hung on a little bit longer, Tim? You also wonder if the Hearts had gotten the push a little bit earlier in '86, if they could have yeah. had, um, you know, some some bigger moments and matches versus the other way around. Even so, it's like they kind of almost waited just a little tad too long to get into the Hearts, elevated mm-hmm. up the card, and now they're kind of in this place where Dynamite can't walk. The Hearts are ready to go, and you know, if you believe the story that Dynamite tells or Brett tells, whoever it was, you know, is it? true that they wanted the Nikolai and Sheik to be the ones that took the titles from the Bulldogs, which is kind of weird. Um, so a lot of moving parts Very here. Weird. Um, but I'm just glad to see the Hearts finally moving up the ladder. I, you know, We've got the pink and black in place. They seem to have the cohesion down. Like, the, all, all of the parts are in place now for the Hearts to move up and they're finally getting them up there. Yeah, they definitely are. They, they've they got a niche now. They've got a gimmick. Um, you know, they, they've probably pass the dream team as the top heel team in the oh, company sure. and yeah. and there's no doubt that uh that the belts are going to be around their waist at some point very soon um yeah no that's that's pretty much that there the 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 the, the heart foundation did skate through 86 which is unfortunate but sometimes that has to happen for you to get your spot back and 
and they're definitely in that place now. All right. So there you go. That is the show. So why don't we do some awards here tonight? Going to mm-hmm. start with our match of the night. Um, I had two that checked in at the same rating. That was Hogan, Kamala, and then the Can-Ams. But, I, I mean, t- there's... You know, they're different ends of the three-star spectrum, right? So I'm going to go with Hogan Kamala for sure on this one. Uh, it, was, it was definitely the most entertaining and biggest match of the evening. I agree. It was my highest rated match. Yeah, I, I'm i going to go Hogan Kamala as my favorite match, um, only because it was such an unexpected and pleasant surprise. You kind of expect uh, Can-Am, Can-Am Dream Team to be pretty decent. I mean, it has a higher probably baseline than, than something like Hogan Kamala. All right. Uh, our cousin Junior, our worst match of the night. There were a few contenders here this yeah. evening. Uh, but I went with Poffo. The, the card. <laughs> I went with Poffo Demon. I thought that was the worst match. Um, I thought Demon was atrocious. I was done, especially at that point in the card. At least the fucking Frenchie match, you can say, was early. You kind of get it out of the way. And then even the, the Bass match was kind of crappy, but that was quick. Um, this was late in the show, off the intermission, just no need for another 14 minute slop between these two. And the demon just looked terrible. Um, so that was easily the worst match of the night for me. What'd you think, Tim? Yep. Agreed for okay. sustained badness. If nothing else, it's, it's gotta be that match. Yep. I agree. All right. Uh, the Hogan award, the MVP. Um, I actually went two guys tonight, one with a tie and one is Hulk Hogan, who, of course, the award is named after, and anytime he's on, usually gets it. And I actually want Danny Davis. I thought he was really good on the show. Um, I liked him in the match where he came out and tried to sneak out there to ref, and they caught him. And then I thought he was awesome in the main event. I loved how, again, how his timing was so sharp. He was always in the wrong place at the right time. And I just, I thought he really was, you know, well done, and the heat was great on him. And this is kind of his peak, I think now for over the next couple of months. So I wanted to give him some love because I thought he was really damn good on this show. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, I agree on both of them, actually. If you want to keep the tie, I'm willing to do it because I think they both worked their butts off in their respective. I mean, Hogan's Hogan. He's always going to wrestle big time. But uh, I, I applaud uh, Danny Davis, too, settling into the role of this uh, shaky referee, Tim. Yeah. Uh, Hogan Award, Hulk Hogan. Uh, but if you want an alternate... Uh... You know what? I'll go to Fink. He uh, he had a good night tonight, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, he was pretty solid on this evening. He was solid. Yep. All right. There we go. All I'm right. Write that down. All right, and uh, next up is our Uncle Elmer Award for the non-MVP, the worst wrestler in the evening. Uh, I went with another tie here tonight, and t- believe it or not, Frenchie Martin is, is not one of the guys um, because I feel. <laughs> Well, I don't care for what he was doing. Like, he's just at least doing something that makes sense. I went with Jerry Allen and Red Demon, who I thought both looked over their skis. I thought they both looked completely lost. I thought they were the direct reason why their matches were terrible. Um, you know, both got carried by better workers, and even that only carried them to duds. I thought both guys just looked like they didn't belong in a ring like this. So that's my choices, and I'm standing by it. Tim, what do you think? I will go... Jerry Allen, just because uh, Red Demon provided me with with uh, <laughs> That's at least reason some, I against him. <laughs> yes, yes, something that I, that I could do something with. Uh, what do you think, Scott? Um, I don't want to go for the. I mean, they were both pretty awful, huh? God, they're fucking terrible. They were fucking <laughs> terrible. But I'm going to give all. I'm going to put all my. Well, and I don't even give it a. Eh, I'll stick with the tie. I'll go with you on that one as well. Okay, they were both pretty awful. They're two though. That was like two of the worst performances we've seen uh, outside of yeah. like our CD. Um, all right, yeah. best moment. I thought this was another easy choice. I went with the Hogan Andre stare. The down. show ending. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank God. <laughs> the credits. Um, I went the Hogan and Andre with the stare down at the title. Yeah. No, I think that's that's hands down. Yeah. Yeah. Easily. Okay. And our uh, our CD award for the most juiced up of the night, I went with Davy Boy here, uh, Tim. Yep, Scott. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's hard to hard to argue with Davy Boy <laughs> anytime he's on the card, and and that's a category. All right, but so the fact they did, they, yeah. do we think he was really juiced more than Hogan? I guess so, huh? Uh, yeah, I think so. I know. I mean, they're both equally juiced. I just Davy Boy shows more. He's just more ripped. You know what I mean? Like Hogan's yeah, no, bulky. You're right. Um, yeah. I mean, whatever. You, either or at this point. All right, so, like, I want to give this, like, a zero, right? But 
there's actually some decent stuff in here. And when you look at some of the other shows that we've really trashed, like December, it had like nothing redeeming besides Hogan Kamala. And, um, you know, two and a half is kind of the lowest I've gone, I think, on one of these house shows. And I don't think it was the worst one we've seen, despite the worst array of <laughs> performances that we've seen. Um, I don't think it's a well-structured card. I did enjoy Gorilla quite a bit. I thought Hogan Kamala this time was a little bit better than the last time. I liked the Can-Ams. I liked the race match. I liked the main event. I liked Danny Davis. Hogan Andre staring on alone bumps it up a bit. So I actually went three and a half on this, um, which, you know, two and a half again was, has kind of been my baseline for like real garbage shows. And this I thought had a little bit more, even though you got to slog through some real trash to get there. So again, not the best show we've watched, but I, I think we, even though this has probably the worst performances we've seen, I think it's not the worst show we've seen. What'd you think, Scott? Well, I gave that December house show a two and that show was, was horrendous. Um, this is, believe it or not, slightly better than that. And that's only because we had a couple of great tags. So I'm going to give this two and a half. Um, I think the Hogan Kamala stands on its own, um, and that Can Am tag is really good. But the rest of the show is is utter trash. And I they really they really needed to consider not doing this breaking the roster up and sticking them all over the country because they left this show with nothing to work with. It's almost like sometimes they take the garden for granted. Like, oh, you're gonna get twenty thousand anyway. We'll just give them you know a bunch of fucking crap and they'll cheer anyway. And that kind of sucks because if I if I had bought this ticket, even I would have been like, uh. But it's Hogan. I know why. You know, it's like Hogan and you could deal with the crap around it. But, I mean, this crap was just real crap. I I can't go above two and a half on this. And this had two better matches than that December show, which, other than Hogan Kamala, had practically nothing. So, two and a half for me, Tim. I think uh, three seems about fair for this show. Uh, You mentioned the the roster being as sort of diluted and and spread as thin as it was. this is not a disaster considering that. I mean, we do have two actually what I would consider good matches mm-hmm. in Hogan Kamala and the Canon Dream Team tag match. Um, yeah, there's some duds in here for sure, but I mean, I didn't have anything dipping into like negative stars or anything like that. Um, it is in essential viewing, certainly, uh, but. Not the worst thing in the world, either. Um, there's certainly been a lot worse out there that, that you can spend your time on. you got to figure, this is... Um, you, you've blown off some major storylines sort of at the end of 86. You're transitioning into new stuff at the beginning of a new year. Uh, so things are a little bit in flux. Um, you know, graded against uh, some of these factors, it's... Um, like I said, at least worth a three. Hmm. All right. Aren't you generous. Yeah. Um, it was a hell of a time um, for sure. <laughs> it was, uh, yes. Sorry, Tim, to do that to you. Um, <laughs> Quite all right. Yeah. Rough going. Uh, so, Scott, we'll be back in two weeks' time. No show next week. Got some traveling in there. Uh, not sure what night that week. Likely in the middle of the week, probably Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and that'll be the February show. Kelly will be back for that one. And then, uh, in three weeks time, we have our big Halloween special and, uh, Tim, maybe we'll be hearing from you again. We'll see. Might not be so long between appearances. Um, Quite possibly. And and then after that, we'll get back into the groove with the March 87 Saturday night's main event. So subscribe to all of our audio feeds, place me nation wrestling, place me nation pop and pro wrestling only. Uh, the big return last weekend of Jeff Learns Wrestling after a few months off due to vacations and to schedules. We reviewed all of WrestleMania 3. So Jeff had some uh, pretty good takes and thoughts, and I thought it was a lot of fun talking to him. Check that out. Also, a new written column I will be doing, uh, The Evolution of ECW. Doing it on my own. I'm just going to go pace by pace. I don't know if it will be any kind of regular schedule, but I'm doing it category format. So there's some uh, fun categories. I'm tracking every appearance ever on ECW because I think there's going to be a lot of cool people that come in and go. So check that out, uh, the Extreme Evolution uh, series by myself on the history of ECW. The first episode's up. That was uh, the first one that's on the network, episode one of Hardcore TV from uh, early 93. So check that out. Um, Tim, anything going on in your world you want to talk about? 
A little bit. Uh, In addition to the aforementioned Halloween spectacular coming up, uh, I sat down with the manager of Place to Be Nation Pop, Todd Weber, for his program, Conversation Comics. So we're actually reviewing uh, some nearly 40-year-old X-Men comics. So if that is your bag, check it out. It's the Chris Claremont, John Byrne run on Uncanny X-Men. We spent two-plus hours going over one issue. So this is a very, very, very deep dive yeah, uh, into some old Thanks. comics. Yes. But if that's your bag, check it out. Um, and a little bit later this month, I will be joining... Jennifer and Miranda on Geek and Sassy, also on the Place to Be Nation pop feed. Uh, that will serve as a little bit of a uh, uh, an appetizer, uh, an idea of what you can expect, perhaps, on the uh, Halloween special coming up. So check that out. Uh, probably probably going to be the week before uh, our Halloween show. So I guess I will uh, be making the rounds this month. This month and uh, should be a lot of fun. Someone's got to do it. I also want to plug uh, a newest making the cut too. Aaron and I ran through some more contenders for the greatest Doty wrestler ever project, which you can still partake in. The deadline has been set December thirty first, twenty seventeen. So still plenty of time to get your ballots in. Plenty of time to do research. Aaron and I touched on Kane, Undertaker, Goldust, X Pac, and Trish Stratus. So check that out. Mm-hmm. If you want to be part of the conversation, uh, just let us know on social media, facebook.com backslash place nation, Twitter, place number two nation as well. Uh, Scott, what do you got going on? Any main events coming up? What do you got? Uh, main event this week, uh, probably drop Thursday. Uh, got a couple of guests, uh, hopefully in the hopper. We'll recap, uh, Hell in a Cell from Sunday and talk about this debacle of a, uh, global impact on demand thing that, uh, that came out today and, and the mess that's kind of surrounding it. So we'll get into some different stuff, uh, uh, this week, but yeah, that'll be on Thursday night main event. We'll drop. All right. Very good. So for Tim and Scott, I'm Justin. We're out. Talk to you in two weeks time from another uh, MSG trip. Kelly will be back. We'll talk to you then. Until then, subscribe to our feeds, enjoy our shows. Participate in the conversation. Be part of the PTBN family. Shop with us, PlayStation.com, backslash Amazon as well. Take care. Talk to you in two weeks. Fuck Jerry Allen. the master of the martial arts. Fuck them all. Back to back, good, belly to belly. Well, I don't give a damn because I'm stoned and already. Back to back, good, belly to belly. It's a zombie jamboree. One female zombie, she wouldn't behave. How she's dancing out of the grave In one hand she's holding a quart of rum The other hand was knocking a conga drum You know the lead singer starts to make his rhyme While the other zombie is rocking in time One bystander he had this to say It was a trip to see the zombies break away And they were singing back to back with more Belly to belly, well I don't give a damn Cause I'm stoned dead already Back to back with Belly to belly, a zombie jamboree And they were singing Back to back to back Belly to belly, but I don't give a damn Cause I'm stoned dead already Back to back Belly to belly, a zombie jamboree Back to back Everyone we sing Back to back And belly to belly Then back to back One, two, three, four What a zombie jamboree Times Square to the Statue of Liberty Uptown, downtown, zombie jamboree Whoa, 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 yeah, yeah There's a high wire zombie between the world trades A King Kong zombie on the Empire State But the biggest zombies took you to Rome The zombies will call the city home Back to back, belly to belly Well, I don't give a damn Cause I'm stoned and already Back to back, oh, 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 belly to belly, it's a zombie jamboree And they were singing, back to back, come on belly. belly to belly, well I don't give a damn Cause I'm stone dead already Back to back, oh, 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 belly to belly, a zombie jamboree I need the chorus, back to back, belly, belly to belly, well I don't give a damn Cause I'm stone dead already, yeah Back to back, come on belly. belly to belly, a zombie jamboree Back to back, belly to belly, well I don't give a damn, cause I'm stone dead already. Back to back, belly to belly, a zombie jumbo, we sing the chorus. Back to back, belly to belly, well I don't give a damn, I'm stone dead already. Back to back.
Belly to belly, a zombie jamboree. 